Before I show you what you're about to see, I feel I need to preface it by letting you know that this is an official licensed Yu-Gi-Oh game. And it isn't from some no-name company either, like the Digimon board game we just did. This game comes from Mattel, one of the largest toy companies on the planet. Welcome to Yu-Gi-Oh! Millennium, a board game from 2002 <laughs> Hey, Yug, I don't feel so good. <laughs> this is insane. And you want to know something else? The actual figures in the box somehow look even worse than the picture. <laughs> I, I think I'm going to be sick. This is an absolute nightmare. This is saber levels of bootleg looking. And you want to know something else else? This is the best Yu-Gi-Oh game. Let's talk about it. Today's video is brought to you by the Battle Cats for iOS and Android, which I can say is without a doubt the craziest tower defense game I've ever played. In this strategy game, you'll manage your economy, create an army of chibi cats to defend yourself, and summon new units to your team to take on even the nastiest threats. Use cheap melee units like the Macho Cat, Tank with the Wall Cat, outrange your opponent with the Sexy Legs Cat. Wait, what? <laughs> Bruh. God, I don't even know if this is a cat anymore. <laughs> okay, I want that one. Wait, what is the... Oh, 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 man. But somehow, this isn't the cat that surprised me the most. The Battle Cats have a brand new collaboration going on right now from the last place I expected. The virtual singer herself, Hatsune Miku. This event has limited edition characters like Miku herself, Kagamine Rin and Len, and Miku as a cat. There's also a ton of special stages featuring official Hatsune Miku music, unique enemies, and a ton of free rewards for players that check it out. The Miku collection unfortunately won't be here forever. Her special event only lasts until April 13th. You can download the Battle Cats for free on iOS and Android by clicking the link at the top of this video's description. The Battle Cats franchise has been around a long time, but they always find new creative ways to put a smile on my face. I never in my life thought I'd get to say this, but thank you to the Battle Cats and Hatsune Miku for helping support our content, and I hope you guys will give it a shot before the event is up. Well, Mama always said don't judge a book by its cover, but I don't know if she ever saw a cover that looked like this. Either way though, I am permanently bound by the curse of exploring crappy retro popular franchise board games, so let's figure out what makes Yu-Gi-Oh! Millennium so special. I do just want to say this game contains some nice looking components, most notably the Millennium Puzzle. Four players will each start with one piece for themselves, and the first player to battle and steal the remaining three pieces can then attempt a final challenge for the fifth piece and winning the game. Why is everybody fighting over the Millennium Puzzle when that's kind of only Yugi's thing and all the major characters that try and steal the puzzle aren't even in the game? I have no idea, but we're going to ignore that nitpick because it's cool and iconic and it's actually really fun to put together and take apart over and over again. So, how do you steal the pieces? By dueling, of course. This game has major duels that take place inside the arena with monsters, and the winner takes all of the other players' puzzle pieces. There's also a variety of minor battles that take place outside the arena, where players battle for each other's monsters and trap tiles. Every turn you roll a die and you can move up to that many spaces in any of eight directions. Any space where there's glowy stuff, stuff happens. Like we mentioned at the arena, you'll call a player to you and battle for Millennium Puzzle Pieces. At the shops, you'll get a new random monster card for the duels. And at the, uh, school and hospital and apartment buildings, you add a trap token to your hand to give you various special abilities. Why do the schools and hospitals have all the traps? I am nitpicking again. The final place you can stop to make something happen is adjacent to another player, which will conduct a battle. Let's talk about battles and duels. Whenever a battle begins, you'll randomly draw a battle card and play one of three different minigames to determine the victor. There's Rock, Paper, Scissors, which is just Rock, Paper, Scissors. There's also Dice Battles, where players roll the two different attack dice and the player with the most hits wins. And finally, there's War. Here, both players shuffle up their trap tokens and reveal one. What's interesting about the traps is that they serve two different purposes. 
On their own, they provide all kinds of invaluable abilities, like adding extra hit damage, warping around the battlefield, forcing an opponent to skip a turn, and forcing monster trades. But they also all have a number in the top right, and in War, the player that reveals a higher numbered tile wins. You automatically lose war if you don't have any trap tiles, so there's a fun strategy element of deciding whether you want to use your traps for their abilities or hold on to them to defend yourself if the war minigame shows up. If you lose a battle, you forfeit your main monster to the winner. If you have no monsters, you forfeit a trap tile. If you have neither, you lose your next turn and probably your remaining dignity for the rest of the game. And in addition, if you win a battle, you earn an extra trap tile. I like these. They're simple little games, mostly RNG, but the random variety and backstabbing nature makes them a lot of fun. It also fits the Yu-Gi-Oh theme pretty well. No matter how good your monsters are, there's always somebody who can just do that. Then there's the main duels in the arena. If you land here, you'll summon an opponent to you and duke it out with one of your collected monster cards. These battles are basically a variant of the dice battle game. Most hits wins, except here your monster choice determines how many times you're able to roll each die. So the monster cards look like this, with an enigma of numbers at the bottom. However, by the power of cheesy early 2000s board game gimmicks, each character you play as has a decoder that reveals how powerful your monster card is, telling you how many green dice and how many blue dice you get to roll. The green die has a 1 in 2 chance to land a hit, while the blue die is only 1 in 3. As you'd expect, certain monsters are more powerful when used by their traditional owner from the series. Mai's Harpy Lady is a massive 5 in 3, but give the same card to Joey and it's a garbage 1 in 2. There are a handful of weaker monsters that have the same attacking power no matter who has them, but a majority have strengths and weaknesses depending on which player you are. I know I've nitpicked the theme a couple of times, but this is one area I will not budge on. They messed up. They do a decent enough job with the big boss monsters. You know, Kaiba and Blue Eyes, Joey and Red Eyes, Yugi and Dark Magician, but some other monsters make zero sense. Why is Black Skull Dragon weaker than Red Eyes? Why is my... Ugh. If they're going to include the token girl to the squad, can you at least give her more than one of her own monsters in the card pool? Mai gets Harpy Lady, and that's it. Now, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt and assume that this game released before Battle City was localized in the West, so they probably didn't have the Amazonist monsters to work with. But why not at least Harpy's Pet Dragon? Why is Mai's second strongest monster Kaiba's Genie? She also has the best numbers for Yugi's Dark Sage and Yugi's Black Luster Soldier. Okay, that is just disrespectful. BLS is the card that Yugi uses to beat Mai. That is just blatantly lazy. While there might not be any balance lore-wise with the monsters and their owners, I did tally it up and conclude that this game is completely balanced stat-wise for each character. Everyone has the same number of green and blue rolls spread out over the game's 24 monster cards. While these major duels are a little bland because they're just a couple of die rolls, there is always the chance that a player reveals one of their trap tiles to swing the rolls or the scores in their favor. The most important part about doing this is that you cannot resist uttering one of my favorite Yu-Gi-Oh catchphrases when doing so. You triggered my trap card! When one player has four of the pieces in their possession, they can attempt to battle for the fifth and final piece to win the game. Here, the three remaining players collude to decide which of them has the best chance at stopping the victor. If the challenger wins, the game goes on, but now they have the remaining four pieces and they've got the target on their back. It's like a wild game of juggernaut. Every time you look powerful, everyone gangs up on you and you get your butt kicked. It's a brutal game of backstabbing, manipulation, luck, and just a teensy bit of strategy. That, combined with its fast pace and varied gameplay, made it a pretty fun experience. And if you've seen some of my past board game sufferings, Pretty Fun is a glowing recommendation for a retro board game. Its hideous figures, lack of depth, and poor respect for the monster lore knocks it down a bit, but I would definitely say the good outweighs the bad. All right, I'm pretty sure some of you guys are feeling a little unsatisfied right now. The best Yu-Gi-Oh game? What a bold claim with nothing to back it. How can this be the best game when I said earlier that Dungeon Dice Monsters is amazing? Or when dope games like Duelist of the Roses exists? Oh yeah, and there's the actual card game itself. In what way is this better than any of those? All right, let me make my case. I think this is the best Yu-Gi-Oh game. Not the highest quality game, but the best representation of the spirit of Yu-Gi-Oh. 
The Japanese phrase Yu-Gi-Oh literally translates to King of Games. And as we've talked about in the past, Yu-Gi-Oh's core original story is a manga, and the manga is about so much more than just one card game. It's a celebration of gaming as a whole. Everything from card games to video games to puzzles to Dungeons and Dragons, yo-yos, digital pets, chess, Russian roulette, darts, mazes, dice games? Rock, paper, scissors? Because readers were so interested in the card game after it was first introduced in the manga, it was given two major story arcs and a major role in the rest of the story's plot. But even then, the original Yu-Gi-Oh! story is still filled with tons of other games and gaming references. For example, the whole reason that Yu-Gi-Oh! uses so much Egyptian imagery and theming is because some of the oldest board games in history, such as Senet, were found preserved in Egyptian tombs. To be the king of games, aka Yu-Gi-Oh!, I feel it's only right that you prove yourself across a variety of games, not just one card game. And not only does the Millennium board game contain multiple little games, but there's a detail I've been hiding from you guys. These games are all named after their Japanese origins, in all translations of the game. Ikusa for war, Saikoro for dice, and Janken for rock, paper, scissors. A lot of these games in particular have heavy Japanese influences. Dice games, for example, have a long history in Japan, especially in gambling circles and Yakuza. Or more wholesomely, maybe you've seen the word Saikoro used in the recent Slice of Life anime, After School Dice Club, where cute anime girls play board games together. And Rock, Paper, Scissors, or Jankin, has a humongous cultural impact in Japan. Jankin is universally known and used everywhere in Japan. It has all kinds of crazy stories and anecdotes, like in 2005, a company president makes two auction houses play rock, paper, scissors to determine which one gets to sell his company's art collection. It was a $20 million game of Junkin. Or there's the Tokyo University's Junkin Robot, which uses a high-speed camera to predict your movements and beat you at the game 100% of the time. The rulebook even includes the traditional phrase that players yell in Japan when playing rock, paper, scissors. John Ken Pong. I was pretty surprised to see this game drawing so much clear inspiration off of Japanese gaming tradition. This dumpster fire bargain bin English produced board game somehow held on to the original spirit of Yu-Gi-Oh! And for that, I am genuinely impressed. On its own, it's just pretty good, but Yu-Gi-Oh! Millennium is the best Yu-Gi-Oh! game. It is also the ugliest.